Welcome to lecture 15 for multivariable calculus. Uh, in this video, I'm going to try to run through the theory, the definitions that we need uh, for this week's uh, lesson. And then, of course, in class, we'll dive into the uh, examples and all the nitty gritty um, that's involved in an effort to keep this really short. I've had it run way too long in the, in the, um, in the run up to doing this. There will be a couple examples in here, but I'm going to breeze through them really quickly with the hope you'll spend some time with them uh, by looking at the slides, uh, playing around, asking on Piazza, asking in class, um, and then they'll they'll make more uh, sense there. I don't expect anyone to absorb them in the time that I, I run through them um, very quickly. Um, but I want to set you up with what we're actually studying so when we get to class, you, you know what's, uh, what's going on. So we're doing two things today, triple integrals, right? We're going to define them and kind of just see what they uh, look like and how setting up, how they uh, are set up. Uh, and then we'll look at applications of integration, uh, thing, which of course is such a broad term. It's really, I mean, almost all of science, if you will, is an application of, uh, of integration. Really what we want to get at here is see it in uh, integrals in slightly different contexts so that we can kind of get a handle on what these, this, machinery of taking integrals really, really is, right? That's, that's the goal. It's not the applications themselves, um, but to hopefully learn something about their nature by looking at the, a couple of applications. So uh, more specifically, we're going to define triple integrals. We're going to look at what changing order of integration looks like in triple integrals that can be involved and we'll do more details in, uh, in class. And then uh, applications of integration, we're going to look at, we're going to define center of mass, right? sort of people have usually have an intuition about moments of inertia, which are a little less, uh, a little less uh, obvious, um, and then a little bit of uh, where probability fits into multiple, um, uh, multiple integrals. Um, so let's not waste time. Let's dive in and do those things. Uh, so let's uh, start with the definition of what a triple integral is. So let's look first at the notation of the formula. We've got the three integral signs, of course, makes it a triple integral. And what that signifies is that our the region that we're integrating over is a solid region uh, in space. So in three dimensions, E is going to represent some, some solid region here. We've got the integrand F right uh, here. Let me see if I can do this spotlight focus. Oh, cool. Um, so we're going to focus now on the integrand, right? So that's a scalar valued function. You can see it takes in three variables here because we're doing a triple uh, integral. And then we've got the, what I call volume form, this differential dV here. Just leave this as notation saying, oh, I'm integrating in three dimensions. So I'm going to measure the uh, integrand, the function I'm integrating, and I'm going to multiply it by a little bit of volume um, there. You don't really compute with this notation here on the left. What this means, though, is this shorthand for this big, long definition uh, on the right. And so it's a triple sum because we've got three uh, dimensions to work with here. But what uh, all integrals are is a sum of a product of two things. You've got the value of some function again right there. We see the integrand, right? So think of in as we move through space across our region E. At every point, we find a number right, that is given to us by f. And we're going to multiply that by some measurement in the domain. Right? So that's volume in the case of a triple integral. It's area in the case of a double integral. It's length in the case of a single integral and extends to higher dimensions in the same, uh, same way. So that's it. There, there's n if you understood double integrals, there's nothing new. Um, uh, there's nothing new about triple integrals that is uh, any more difficult theoretically. Right? No, instead of adding up areas of rectangles times a value of a function, now we've got volumes of a little piece of space times a value of a function. And we add that up all over. Now, of course, we don't actually use that limit definition frequently to compute uh, these guys. Right? Instead, what we do is we use Fubini's theorem and we write an iterated integral. So this works just like it does in two dimensions, right? Where we had a uh, one integral inside another. Now we've got three dimensions, so we've got three um, integrals. But let's let's look at this um, form uh, for a second uh, here. So I've got this typical triple integral. The thing to the thing to pay attention to 
here is that the inside variable, so in this case I'm doing z on the inside, right, it's inside because it sort of comes first uh, there, its bounds are a function of the other two, right, of what's left over. So you can see the upper bound is a function, uh, it's this function k, the lower bound is a function j. So you want to think of this uh, region in space E is defined as the space between two surfaces defined by k and j. So k would be the upper bound um, of our surface and j would be the lower bound. Right? So each of those has a graph that's a surface in three dimensions. k defines the upper part, j defines the lower part. And then that region can be cut off in the other two variables in y and x. So after um, after I look at the inside variable, I tend to look at the last two sort of in tandem, and now it's just like it was, like it is in a double integral here. Y is defined by the bounds of G and H. They can be functions of, of X, or they can be uh, constants, the lower one being G and the upper one uh, being, being H. And then X is cut off between uh, uh, constants A and B. And so the result of these three integrals being computed, I integrate out, uh, I integrate out z first, right? And this guy in parentheses is a function of x and y, and then it really does become a double integral of those two, uh, of those two things, uh, there. So again, in theory, not any harder if you understood double integrals and iterated integrals. Uh, triple integrals are no are exactly no more difficult. Right. I'm going to run through it, as I said, run through an example real fast uh, next. And again, you can kind of pause this, slow it down, or just play with the um, slides to try and right, to try and gather what's going on here. So let's look at a uh, quick example. So set up an iterated integral to find the mass of a region between the surfaces. Z is x squared plus y squared, and z is 2x plus 1 if the density is given by this rho x, y, z equals 2z. Okay, we didn't really talk about mass and density yet, um, but here's a brief lesson. If you integrate density, you get mass, right? Because density is mass per unit volume. So what you're doing is you're adding up over a whole region, a, a density, a rate, mass per unit volume, times a little bit of volume, you get total mass. So we add that up over our whole space, we get total mass. What you need to know is that 2z here, um, uh, 2z is the integrand right, that we're looking at. So we're going to integrate that function, 2z, twice the height. And then we've got our two surfaces. Those we see are exactly defined the surfaces that bound our region. So right, z is x squared plus y squared is a paraboloid z is 2x plus 1 is a plane, and there's some region in space cut off by those two. Here's a picture. That's the important bit. We can see that, ah, all right, so x squared plus y squared, that's the bottom here, right? You can kind of see the um, uh, rounded piece of the paraboloid there on the bottom, and it's cut off on top by, a, uh, by the plane 2x plus 1. Here. So that's the region in space. The integrand 2z does not show up in this picture, right? It's a triple integral. We're in three dimensions, so we only see where we're integrating. We don't see the what we're integrating in this picture here. But when we form, um, when we go to form the uh, triple integral that describes this, what we want to do is figure out what is the region in the x and y. So we're going to find out where those two surfaces intersect right there. In fact, what we're trying to do is if I look down at this region from up above, I'm trying to define that region in the xy plane here. I can see already what the bounds in z are. I want to figure out what the bounds in x and y are. And so I'm just going to find the intersection of my two surfaces, and that's going to define uh, that region. So it's just simple algebra. I set the two surfaces equal to each other. Right? Right? I then do some rearranging and I complete the square. And I realize, oh, my region is just a circle. Right? It's centered at 1, 0. It's got radius root 2 right there. So it's centered at 1, 0, radius root 2. Right? It's easy enough to see what the bounds in y are to solve this 
expression for y. And then I'm ready to set up my whole uh, triple integral. So let's just see all the parts um, uh, of this guy again. Okay, get my little spotlight out here. 2z, that's the density. That's the, the thing we're integrating. So there's a number at every point, right? And so it's given by 2z. I then have my bounds in z, right? I see dz here. The lower one is x squared. Uh, uh, is x squared plus y squared. The upper one is 2x plus 1. It is important that the smaller value goes on the bottom and the larger value goes on top. I can, I can uh, uh, expound on that if you, right, if you would like. So those are the bounds. Notice they can depend on x and y uh, uh, here. Right? But then I'm going to use my other bounds. y is next, the middle uh, variable there. That can only be a function of x. Right? Z is sort of gone after, at, once we get to this stage. Right. And we solve for our two values of y, and then the two ex the extreme values of x. These guys here, they have to be um, fixed scalars. Right? You can't have any variables uh, in this outer in um, these outer limits and have the whole thing make sense. Right? The the um, uh, a multiple integral uh, specific a definite multiple integral is a scalar after you evaluate it. Uh, so you can't have um, variable expressions on the outside and, and then just have a, a single scalar there. It's a good check on whether you set things up right. It's just like, okay, does the expression even make sense? Um, so there is the uh, expression for right, this problem. It's an iterated um, integral. Real quickly, if you want to know how to compute these things in um, uh, in Python, right? dive into the, the slide to do it. But here is just a, a small bit of code. We had double quad for computing a double integral. Unsurprisingly, it's called triple quad, triple TPL quad for triple quadrature um, in, uh, for, for a triple integral. The help function tells you a little bit about what's going on here. Again, we take in a function. That's the thing we're integrating, so 2z in the case uh, we just saw. We've got bounds in x, bounds in uh, y and then bounds in z, right, where those latter two can be functions of the others. Notice the order is a little funny again. We've got this thing where when we give it the integrand, we have to give the variables in the order z, y, x um, here. Right? It kind of it mirrors the order that we did our integral in uh, in the, the differentials. Maybe that's, that's helpful. Anyway, there's some sticklers too. So here's our integral. If I want to implement it, here it is. Feel free to copy and paste this code if you want to uh, try your own uh, there. Again, the, the code is not the important part. Reading the mathematics, mathematical notation up here is, uh, is important for everybody uh, to do. I think being able to go back and forth, though, is a good skill um, here. So let's evaluate this thing. I don't know. We should get some number if we did everything uh, right. Indeed, remember, here's the answer, 29.3. All right, that's the number we got out of this guy. That was the total mass uh, for this one. And remember, here's the error, right? E to the minus 9 uh, there. Good enough for most any application you can have if you're building a house or something and, you know, need to know about how much uh, tin you need. Um, right, accuracy to that level is great. If you're doing particle physics, you might, might need something a little more sophisticated. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's a setup of a typical triple integral really fast about what switching your order of integration means here, right? We've got three variables now. So that means you've got six uh, ways of arranging them, right? You know, z, y, x, y, x, z, x, y, z, etc. Um, uh, here, where we only had two for two variables, right? You get off you know, factorial going on. You can think about it for seven variables, you'll, your head will spin uh, here. So we want to write the triple integral, all right? Triple integral over some uh, region E of uh, F right, dV. So E is the region in the first octant. Right? So that's good. That bounds our region. All the variables x, y, and z are going to be positive. That's a good way to start when practicing these. Just kind of let's right, take the signs of x, y, z out of it and just leave them positive. And then I've got two surfaces bounding here. But this is the tricky, um, tricky business is that these surfaces are not just functions of z, right? They're different uh, here. Right? And that's where the uh, difficulty lies. Here's a picture that we uh, 
that we need for this. So I want you to observe the two surfaces that bound our function. Right? One, z is a function of the other two. It's really just a function of one variable here. That's this surface on top here, that uh, parabolic cylinder. y equals 1 minus x is a plane. You see that piece over here, right there. So when we go to write this as an iterated integral, the first decision you have to make is which variable goes on the inside. And so uh, here there are two kind of good choices and one bad one. Um, so the two good choices are z or y on the inside because I have those explicitly written as bounds of the other two variables. I'll show you what I mean. z, 1 minus x squared. So right, the upper bound as a function of the other two is 1 minus x squared. The lower bound is zero here because we're in the first octant. So you kind of see that on the floor there. So z goes from zero up to one minus x squared. And once we decide that, right, then we can use the other guys to the other uh, surface and the first octant to show you what the cutoffs are in y and x. And if we view this whole thing from above, you can kind of see clearly, oh, I can see what region in the xy plane is being cut off. Right. Um, uh, here, I've got x going from 0 out to 1 here, right? This is, this is x. And then for each x, y goes up to here, right? There's a typical slice, right? That's 1 minus x, of course, being there. So to put those uh, um, uh, to put those two together, right? Go back to a regular perspective uh, here. Right here are the bounds of the z on the inside. You see z going from zero to one minus x squared. You should really think of this guy as a function of x and y uh, there. So they got the two surfaces here, and then these guys together give the bounds in y and x. Y goes from zero to one minus x, and x just goes from uh, zero to one. One way to check that you did this right is just to take an arbitrary integral here. I pick something, pick something that's not symmetric in x, y, and z um, here, because then when you integrate over these bounds, we're going to get some number. So again, this is my triple quad. Here's my function, right, defined in the right order, z, y, x here. That corresponds with z, y, x over, right, over here. I just picked an arbitrary integrand. There's nothing special about this function. I just just pick something. It's unlikely um, if we switch orders and uh, get the same answer, it's unlikely that we did it wrong. So you see x goes from 0 to 1 here. Um, y goes from 0 up to the function 1 minus x, so the function of one variable there. And then we see z goes from 0 to 1 minus x squared, but that's the function of two variables, right? x and y um, there. So that's something. So let's just evaluate that. Okay. So the answer is whatever it is, point. 0.28 uh, in this case. Again, I, I just picked an arbitrary integral for f here. You'll see y in a second, uh, though. So when I want to switch orders of integration for y to go on the inside, right here, go back to the picture. So now what I want to do is y as a function of x and z. That's easy because y is already a function of x for this surface right there. So y will go from 0 out to that surface at 1 minus x over here. And then all we need to do is figure out how x and z get cut off um, move that over here. And you can kind of see, and if we look down at the xz plane here, we just see the parabola z equals 1 minus x squared cutting it off. So the bounds in x and z, x again goes from 0 to 1, right? And then z will go from 0 up to 1 minus x squared um, there. Uh, altogether, what this amounts to is that switching y on the inside is just as easy for this example here, right? It really just looks like switching these guys, although you're sort of doing something a little more sophisticated. Now we're thinking of 1 minus x as a function of two variables, and you got 1 minus x squared here. So x goes on the outside. We get a, uh, um, I'm going to test the same integrand in a different order. So that's the reason I picked this weird integrand here, is I'm going to Take the same integrand, but I'm going to do a different order, y, z, x. So that's y on the inside, then z, then x right here. And so again, I've got 0 to 1 in x. Now z goes from 0 to 1 minus x squared here. And then y goes from 0 to 1 minus x. Right? Notice that's a, I write that as a function of x and z, even though it's independent of z uh, here. So the reason I did that is now we 
execute this. Oh, look, it looks like I got the same number there and there. It's, it's actually is exactly the same estimate. Notice the error estimates are actually slightly different. They're both very small, 10 to the minus 15 um, there. But because of the, the these are numerical approximations, there are slight differences in floating point arithmetic and, and what have you. But it's really, really unlikely that we messed it up and got an answers that are this close uh, to each other for some wacky uh, interval this way. If you pick something really symmetric here, um, sometimes you can actually screw it up and, and you not notice if you have like x times y times z. And then if you switch the roles, you might not notice uh, there. So that's why I picked something not symmetric. OK, uh, let's go. Last point, all right, it's probably the only uh, thing we want to point out here is that the third choice for inside um, integral would be x right, in this case. And that one is the difficult. Uh, one, I want to emphasize this, all right, this point. What makes a good choice for an inside interval uh, um, variable is one where it's clear that the bounds in that variable are nice functions of the other variables here. In this example, if I pick x on the inside, that means I need to write x as a function of y and z. And that means the upper bound on x has this, right, has dependency on two different regions here. So I'm going to look down at the yz plane now, you can see that in one area, one surface is bounding x above, and the other, another area, another bound is above. So you can still do this, but the reason it's hard is because you've got to balance where, where does one surface bound x and where does the other surface bound x. Really, I just want you to think of that x is probably a bad choice uh, to do on the inside um, uh, here. Right? Of course, I did it anyway. You can split it up into two cases. Right? You can investigate whether you got this answer right. And to test out, same integrand as, as before, split into two regions. Right? Let's evaluate. Ah, we got right, very, very close answer out to so not Not all the way because, right, again, of rounding errors, um, but accurate enough that it's very unlikely we did it wrong. Uh, there. OK, I want to keep uh, going and start talking about applications of integration. There are just a couple that you need to know for this class, but you want to see what, you know, you know the commonalities are what I really want you to uh, take away from this so that when you apply it in your field, um, you'll be like, oh, okay, I need to assemble this quantity and then an integral is the right thing to do. And this is what I should integrate. Uh, and this is what I should measure it against, uh, et cetera. Okay. So the basic pr principle of integration, I think when you really boil it down, make it look really uh, silly is you're trying to compute some desired integral. It has a nice fancy a name here at uh, desideratum uh, there if you like if you like uh, Latin expressions and you get that by integrating the elements all right so the elements add up to be the desired quantity des desideratum and I have a silly equation here to show you that oh all right so spade is the integral of d spade right there it says that all right I want a total of something you add up the parts of it. Right. And so looked at this way, the integration looks really, um, really silly, but that really is the principle we can apply to do, uh, do all sorts of cool um, uh, calculations. So what are the things that we add up? Right? We know about areas and volumes, but I think a better way to uh, think more generally about integration is think about densities. Right. So what is a density? It's a ratio. Right. How much uh, you find of something per unit of space. Um, really. So often we just think about mass density. So things like grams per milliliter uh, here. So mass per unit volume, right? That's the kind of classic idea of density being um, um, mass density uh, there. And so if we do a triple integral of mass density, as we saw uh, earlier, you're adding up uh, a density, a ratio times a volume. So, right? so that gives you a mass, right? Mass over volume times volume gives you mass. So if you add that up over your whole region, you get the total mass uh, of your region. But more generally, right, we are lots of other kinds of densities. So you get stuff per unit of measure, right? Is the way I think of as a, um, a density. And the reason we're in the calculus realm is that stuff per unit can vary continuously over um, some domain. You don't have just one kind of density, right, for every object, right? If you think of the Earth's crust as you move 
uh, through it, right, the densities literally change, right, the compactness of the soil, its consistency, what minerals are in it, right, the density varies all over the place. So almost at every point, there's a different uh, density. So we need integrals to add up all that, that continuous change, right, an infinitesimal change uh, over your over your region. Anyway, here's a quick couple of uh, other examples of other right, densities that you might encounter uh, or have encountered already. Resistivity, all right, so you know that um, in the uh, conduction of elect electricity, right, some different media have different resistance, right, no different uh, ability to stop the flow of uh, electricity. So resistivity is a density, right, it's ohms per meter. So along uh, <coughs> Uh, along a wire, the longer the wire is, the more resistance it uh, it tends to it tends to have. So you've got ohms per meter as resistivity uh, there. So if you want to find the total resistance, right, the total ohms right, along the wire, so along some length, so zero to L, right, integrate that resistivity uh, times dx. So it is a density, right, resistance per length um, uh, here, and that thing can vary, right, very continuously. I don't know the makeup of your alloys of your wire probably can mean that resistivity can change throughout the medium depending on how perfect your manufacturer is. I don't know anything about really about wire manufacturing um, here. Just an example in one dimension. In two dimensions, probability densities. This is one of some of my favorite right um, here. So probability density function of two random pairs, really a joint probability uh, density function. Um, here I'll use rho as this. So that means it's a, right, it's a density of probability. So per unit area, in this case, you've got density. So if you integrate over some region E in your sample space for your two variables, right, so that will be called an event, it turns out, right? A region in your sample space is an event, and you want to find the probability of the event occurring. Right? Well, so you've got this continuous change of, of probability. You integrate over that region. You just integrate the probability density over that region. You get the probability. If, that, if you put in the whole sample space, you get one. That's what makes it a probability density. Uh, so you'll in, undoubtedly study these things in more detail at some point in the future. And you know, chemical engineers, uh, again, I won't pretend to know anything, but here in three dimensions, right, you've got the uh, concentration of carbonic acid uh, here with the little brackets um, uh, there. So you have some solution, and, and, right, and it changes throughout the solution. That density can be... Um, can buy here, so right, it's just kind of amount of moles, I guess, of carbonic acid per liter uh, or per milliliter, say. So if you integrate over your region, right, what that density is, you just get the total amount of, of carbonic acid there. I mean, so in all these cases, you've got a, right, a, a ratio of density, right, stuff per unit, right, of measure, and you add it up times all the measure, you get the total, total amount of stuff. Uh, Okay, to get things a little bit more uh, solid, so what are the ones we want? We, are, we want to be able to do um, <clears throat> center of mass, right, uh, moments of inertia, and then we'll see what they, those look like in, in the probability context real fast. Real quick review of our mass, uh, basically, the center of mass. Start with a discrete case, because really what, to understand what an integral is, it's good to see the transition over and over again from a discrete, right, finite uh, um, finite system into a continuous system where you need an integral. So sums in the discrete case become integrals in the continuous case. Think of the most simple kind of kinetic system, static uh, um, physical system. We can think of two masses, right, along a line, right? One is at position x1, one's at position x2. Right? So m1 is a mass at a position x1, m2 is another mass at position x2. Total mass, let's easy, just add them up. Right? Nothing, right? nothing uh, shocking there. But then when we talk about center uh, of mass, what makes what are we talking about by the center of mass? It's going to be a position. Uh, so I call it x bar um, here to say indicate that it's position. And it kind of balances that torque, if you like, if you're thinking about it in a kind of a gravity uh, um, context here. Anyway, we want to have this kind of balanced equation if we Attempt to, attempt to draw this um, piece of thing. So we've got kind of along our line here, I've got two masses. So let's say here's M1 at position X1. And then I've got another mass over here. Let's make it bigger. At position M2. Uh, 
uh, M2. Don't leave, the, don't leave this in my fault spot there. What makes the uh, what makes the center of mass is that kind of you can just intuitively think about balancing uh, this kind of bar. Right? Don't don't give the there's going to be some point here. Right? That's x bar, and what we're saying is that the torques balance right at the center of mass. So that's mass times distance away. So x1 is less than if we orient our um, position to the right, all right, x1 minus x0 is going to be negative, right, so we get some negative uh, uh, torque here, and we want to balance that out with the m2, and so we get this nice, right, uh, nice looking equation, right, that makes, uh, makes sense, and then we can just solve it simply for uh, x bar, right, simple, simple arithmetic, um, uh, here and so what do we see here well with this top guy right there we're gonna call that the first moment it's the mass times the positions right added up right? it looks like a dot product it is uh, also considered you can also consider that a, um, uh, a dot product but we have we're adding up at each place where we have mass the mass times the position we add them all up. divide by the total mass here There's another way to look at this Right. Um, another way to look at this here, I like this way, is now we can see really what one way to think about this center of mass. It's a weighted average of the positions. Right. So you got x1 is weighted by the percentage of the mass we find there. Right. M1 divided by the total mass. Right. That's how much of the mass, relative amount of the mass that we find there, plus m2 over m times x2. How much of the mass we find at that position. So we're weighting x1 and x2 by how much we find there, right? So it really is a weighted, uh, weighted average. Okay, that's the discrete case. What happens when we move um, uh, to the continuous case? All right, so now we're gonna think about, we're gonna do it in two dimensions. We're gonna think we have a, a planar region here, all right? D, I'm gonna think of that as the surface of this serving tray, all right? You've seen this uh, weight staff uh, carry these things around. All right, there we've got some, uh, D would be the represented by the, the tray here. And then we've got varying density. Right? We've got different drinks on this tray. So in different regions, the, the uh, mass kind of being pushed down on this uh, tray by gravity is changing. Right? So rho is a function of where you are, right? And it varies over the surface D, right? It's heavier near the more full um, drinks. And of course, it's lighter by the, by the empty space, the empty cup there. And if we integrate the density, right, mass per unit area here over the whole region, we get m. So just like adding up uh, the total mass in the previous slide, just add up the discrete mass. Now we integrate to get the total mass, but it's always density times area. Right here gets you gets you total mass um, here. Okay. So what about uh, center of mass in um, in this context? I've always thought it remarkable how good the weight staff at various establishments are at multivariable calculus. They all seem to know exactly where the center of mass is. They can do some, right? They know how to integrate here. So the center of mass, again, it's a kind of, you can think of it as a weighted average of position. We use this funny notation though. Well, so X bar, Y bar, those are the positions of the center of mass. And we use what we call these moments here, but we have to add up relative to the Y axis and relative to the X axis here. So the center of mass in the X direction or the X coordinate of the center of mass is measured relative to the y-axis. That's why this funny notation is there. It's actually not a not a misprint um, here. All right, here's the all right, so here's the definition. My is called the first moment uh, relative to the y-axis, but it's just the x position times the density. So I think of this as position times mass right here. Right, this uh, kind of this bit together density times area, it's like D little m, if you like, right? Change in mass, so a little bit of mass times the position. You add that, add those guys up, you get the y moment, you add up in the with the y coordinate, you get the uh, x moment, right? And, right, and uh, put them together, divide by mass, you get the center 
of mass on everything. Really, I mean, what do you need to remember? This is, I think, the easier way to remember it. All right. So where's the center of mass over a region D with density rho? Right. We integrate x times the density in the numerator. Right. That gives me the moment. Divide by the total mass. Right. Do the same thing in y. So x y x y. Right. Um, so know that formula for um, uh, um, computing the center of mass. All right there. Uh, one thing I'll share with you, I, I like center of mass, which is a weird thing to say um, probably, but I like it as a concept. For one thing, it's something I believe in very much that's immaterial, right? I think that like, you know, I have the center of mass, even though it's not, it's not something I could put under a microscope or hold up, all right? I believe in it. Uh, the other thing I like so much about center of mass is the following, um, uh, factoid uh, that someone shared with me that uh, professional pole vaulters, all right, so elite uh, pole vaulters, uh, you know, they run, stick a stick a stick in the ground, vault themselves over um, over a pole, of course. Um, but uh, one of the facts about the way that they contort their bodies to do it is that while their body, of course, goes over the pole for a valid jump, their center of mass goes under it. Um, which I think is, uh, you know, sometimes it's like it's cheating and uh, things. So it actually literally like kind of leaves their body and, and rejoins on the way back down. It's a, uh, something to think about, um, um, you know, next time the Olympics roll around, whatever that is. Uh, okay. So here's a really quick example to think about center of mass. And I like doing center of mass problems. They're really easy to come up with even in the abstract, and they're fun in the following sense. So here's center of mass unit squared. So... 01 by 01 is just the unit square in the plane, but the density is changing. So the density is x plus y. Right? Here's a picture of um, uh, of that setup. So here's my unit square, right? X times uh, 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 0 to 1 by 0 to 1 there. The colors represent the density. Right? Density is x plus y. So it's 0 in the blue area. It's very light over here. Right? And then it increasingly gets heavy as we move in the, this direction, right? in the 1, 1 uh, direction. So at the halfway point, right? everywhere here, the density is 1, and it goes up to 2 over here. So again, we got the square, and it's got, a, I think of it as a heavy corner over here, right? medium in the middle, and then a very light corner over uh, there. So if this thing were uniform, it would be fairly obvious where to put the center of mass. right? If this thing had uniform density, it would be, uh, it would be right in the middle there. That's not going to balance this case, right? If I tried to support this tray, if you will, at this point, it would fall over. Right? This heavy side would outweigh this guy, and the whole thing would fall over. So the challenge, the fun um, uh, bit here, is before you compute things, take a guess, right? Draw your region, right? If you can, use some technology to color. If you have varying density, to kind of color it in. And then just mentally take a guess as to where your center of mass would go right it can't be here so you can argue make a few uh guesses so up here i'll take my guess here i don't know it's got to be heavier i can do some reasoning some some symmetric reasoning and be like okay though it's the same in each every direction this way so the center of mass is probably along this diagonal but it's got to be more toward the heavy side i'm going to say it's it's over here somewhere right there's my uh there's my guess, and then I have it rigged to do it. So let's let's guess where is the center of mass? Oh, I was off. All right, I was off by by a little bit. All right, there's the center of mass. Okay, let's compute it anyway. Um, here, oh. oh, did I did I miss the the computation? All right, well let's uh, um, let's do it here. All right, so I got. Right. Double quad with uh, y x. I'll do it in that right in that order. It's x plus y, and then I've got zero to one and zero to one. That's my axes, right? And that's going to be the total mass, right? Here I'm integrating the density x right, x plus y from zero to one to zero to one. That's easy. All right. So one is the total is a total mass. Not surprising, zero to two, right? So nice and, nice and evenly uh, distributed. 
um, here. Now the neat thing to compute now the center of mass then we can divide by the total masses one. So I'll just um, oops. So I'm just gonna uh, copy. I'll just uh, well actually I'll just modify this guy a little bit. Right here I take the density. And to find the x-coordinate now, all I need to do is multiply by x. Right? And I get 0.583. All right? and that's what we got there. So right. <clears throat> what's 7 twelfths, I think, uh, here. And of course, this guy's so symmetric that if I do the same computation in y, I get roughly the same. I get the same answer for where is in y. So 7 twelfths, 7 twelfths, I guess, is the... Uh, is where the, the so it's a moves just a little bit away from the actual center at 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Yeah. Anyway, I like doing these problems, guessing where the uh, center of mass is. We'll do one in class. As well. All right. Oh, there we go. Same same computations there. All right. So moments of inertia is the next uh, thing we want to uh, consider. So these are a little less. Um, uh, obvious, but one way to think of what a uh, moment of inertia, or I'm going to call it I, for a massive body is, it's kind of resistance uh, to rotation. So in other words, uh, if you think of mass as resistance to movement somewhere, right, you put the same force on uh, a, an object with more mass, it, right, it accelerates at a much less, uh, proportionally less rate. Uh, there, you can think of moment of inertia as kind of that idea, but for, um, uh, for rotation. Uh, um, here, so if you have a small moment of inertia, it's easy to spin, and if you have a very large moment of inertia, it's, it's kind of hard. It takes a lot of effort um, uh, to spin. So angular momentum L, all right? That's I times omega, right here. That's the angular velocity, right? Radians per second or per unit time. Uh, there. Anyway, this is generally conserved, right? In perfect, nice uh, rotational. Uh, motion here. Uh, there's an easy way to remember this. Good old, if you've ever watched figure skating, um, here what's happening, right? The figure skater goes into uh, goes into a spin, has some uh, angular momentum, right? When she starts to spin, spinning on the um, skate, and then, right? How does she speed up then, right? Do, do they all do that changes her moment of inertia, right? Her, so what was her mass is uh, kind of spread out initially, and then she pulls it in. Um, toward the axis of rotation, right, just vertical uh, from her skate. Uh, and when it gets smaller, then the angular momentum is conserved, the angular velocity has to increase, right? So this, right, you've seen this phenomenon, you spin in an office chair and pull your legs and you can, you can reproduce this if you can't skate um, here. Anyway, so that's what intuitively what moment of inertia is. The way we measure it, um, though, it has a pretty... Um, pretty basic idea. So whereas when we did center of mass, we took the first moment, we kind of weighted the position x by the density rho. Now what we're going to do is measure x squared. So now it's not um, it's not signed, right? It doesn't uh, balance out. We want to know how it's spread out from the center. So if we take, um, again, we got a <coughs> A body D in the plane, we got a de varying density over there, and I want to measure it rotating around the origin. You can think of that as rotating around uh, the Z axis too. If you think of the Z axis as poking out of the plane, right? Think about rotating your body around the Z axis. Then, what an all an all a moment of inertia is? It's double integral of the distance squared to the axis. All right, so x squared plus y squared here. Think of it as the distance squared uh, to the axis times the density times the little area element. Right? So this is mass again over here, right? Times distance squared, right? So that's always positive, right? Always measure how far you are from the from the axis of rotation um, here. And so if your density is very close to the axis of rotation, right? When the the, the um, skater right kind of uh, compacts herself around the axis of rotation, your uh, moment of inertia goes down. And when you're spread out, right, your moment of inertia goes up, right? This number gets much, much, much bigger. Okay, so let's uh, compute uh, the moment of inertia for that square above, right? This, uh, just that, this guy 
here, right? So again, so I want to compute, I'm going to compute it around two different axes here. Once around the origin, so imagine taking the square now and saying, okay, how much is it going to take to spin it around the origin? So imagine it's fixed in this corner and can spin uh, there. Or, right, and then I'm going to do a second computation because if you change the axis, you change the computation. I want to do relative to the y axis. So if I want to take this whole thing and spin it around the y axis, I hope your intuition tells you that it's harder to spin it around the origin because the mass is farther away, right, from the origin than it is to spin it around. Uh, the y-axis. There. So we'll just compute that quickly and see how it goes. All right. So around the origin, we just saw the formula for it. There's the density row. All right. There's the distance to the origin squared. And since our bounds are 0 to 1, 0 to 1, this is fairly trivial. There we all right. Um, there you have it, whatever that is, 5 sixths. Um, uh, there. There's the moment of inertia around the right. around the origin right here. If I want to do um, uh, the moment of inertia around the y-axis, I need to measure the distance to the y-axis squared. Right? But uh, just be surprised. Right? That's just, right? oh, sorry, here I've got the x-axis, which is this thing is symmetric. I said y-axis, so let's just take that x squared. It gives you distance to the y-axis uh, there, which you're not surprised. Which when we compute, we realize, oh, wait, it's exactly half. Right, which is not always my uh, intuition uh, at first when I look at the picture, right, that it's exactly half the angular momentum uh, around the y-axis than around the origin uh, here. Until you look at the formula and you realize, that, oh, wait, look at this. Right, integration is linear. So around the origin, it's exactly around the two axes added, right, just adds together. Right? There are a lot of interesting um, consequences of that, right? There's a linear process going on here. There's, um, there are matrices involved, but that's for another, another time. And just, here's a picture. There's my little square, right? It's shown in three dimensional space and I'll just rotate copies around it. So the same angular momentum would take it around the Y axis actually twice when that it would take it to go once around the Z axis because the momentum is, uh, moment of inertia is half. Okay, really quickly, probability now. So if you've got two random, very real uh, random variables, X and, right, X and Y, these are just, you can think of them as, uh, if you haven't encountered random variables um, before, as um, uh, processes that spit out a number, right, uh, with, with some random element to them, right? Not consistent. I often think of when you think of two uh, random variables like this, I think of a dartboard, right? The X and Y position of a dart you throw uh, here is pretty, right? it's pretty random in my case, more random than um, uh, than others, right? But when you throw a dart uh, at a dartboard or, you know, aim at my symbol um, over there, you can imagine there's some distribution along the wall of where my the dart is likely to land. Uh, and so the X coordinate would be one random variable and the Y coordinate um, uh, would be another. And you realize that there's right, more likelihood in some regions than, right, than in others. And so if you want to find a probability uh, of it landing in a particular region, you just integrate your probability density over that region. Right? If you integrate over the whole space, right, you have to get one. That's what makes it a probability density. It's also it has, it's positive there. So in a lot of ways, it behaves like mass density. Right? It was certainly the positive part uh, as well. Um, but it's not mass per unit area, it's probability per unit area. Um, and so the probability event, we just integrate over that region that specifies that event to get the total probability. Right? Um, so here's a really fast uh, example that's interesting. And again, I like these problems also because you can sign up test your intuition, whether you can answer the question without, uh, and then right, compute it, see how good your, your ideas are. With probability, uh, intuition, as you may know, often goes out the window. So I got the probability that two numbers randomly chosen between zero and one have a product greater than a half. Right? So I'm, I'm kind of, I have to understand what it means to pick a random number between zero and one, I close your eyes on a number line, pick a random number, uh, but um, um, uniform distribution, every one, every chunk is as likely as every other. One. So I pick two numbers between zero and one, and I multiply them together. Right? What's the probability that their uh, product is greater than a half? 
Now, on a, a really first, you know, fast one second calculation here, if you said, oh, it's like half, right? Because all, if I multiply two numbers between zero and one, I get a number between zero and one. And so half a chance of being above half and half a chance of being below would, is not an insane estimate. It's wrong, but it's not an insane uh, first guess. Um, uh, here, you realize that, oh, wait, no, because if I take right square root of two is actually like, you know, 0.7 something um, uh, there. So if I have two numbers below 0.7, they're always going to be right. They're always going to be less than uh, less than a half. And so really, it's not really very intuitive at all. So we, in order to answer this question, we need to think about, all right, here's my sample space. Right? As, so I think of as a uniform sample, right? So my pair of functions that a pair of numbers that I pick can be chosen from anywhere inside this square or there. And then the event of it being greater than a half is just this corner up here, right? Where did that um, come from? So I used a contour function here of the function x times y. So if x times y is a half, I've got y is 1 over 2x. That's this line here, right? And so for this uh, region, the product is bigger than a half. And for this whole region, the product is less. Uh, than half. So if you want to figure out what the chances of your two random numbers having a product bigger than a half, we just need to find the area of this piece here. Uh, really, or we just integrate. Right? We just integrate to, to find it. Um, and I won't leave you in suspense. All right? It's only about 15%. Right? So right, if you do this, so the, the, again, smaller than my probably first guess would have been um, whenever I first thought of this problem. Two random numbers between zero and one, multiply them, you only got a 15% chance of getting above a half uh, there. Um, right? And if you actually, you can easily work that out uh, analytically, right? You can do it on paper if you don't have double quad available, um, and you just get uh, a half minus log two or two. It's natural log. Um, uh, there, right? Same number. Uh, so there you go. Probability is a wonderful, rich subject, um, and, and multiple integration is key to it. Uh, you notice that you'll see the first moment right, for probability uh, density, so we multiply x times the probability density, y times the probability density, that looks like center of mass. Right here, really, it's the same calculation mathematically. We call it the expected value of our, of our uh, distributions, kind of on average over the long term. What do you expect um, uh, to get? Well, that's literally, you use the first moment to do it, right? You kind of weight the output of your variable by the probability of it occurring, right? Add it up, right? That gives you the probable output of your, uh, um, the expected value of your probability distribution function, right? So we use the same notation as center of mass here, right? So it's kind of center of a probability distribution. Uh, second moment, if you move over and do um, uh, uh, moments relative to the center, relative to the expected value here. So that's when I notice I have an x minus x not squared and y minus uh, y not squared uh, there. Those are the, what we call the variances uh, for your distribution, right? How spread out they are, right? How from the, right, from the expected value, right? Is, uh, do we always get something very close, right? Professional dart players have very small variance in their and they're aiming. Mine is enormous, um, dangerous even. Yeah. And uh, uh, so second moments, right, where it's basically x squared, right? So it's shifted a little bit, but it's just basically the square integrated against the density gives you, right, gives you variances, right? And the list goes on of things in, in, in probability and other places to mixed moments. So that's where I'm multiplying an x times a y coordinate against the density, against the probability density, and get so-called mixed moments, covariance. You can measure independence um, or, or lack thereof on variables uh, that way. You can keep going, right? There are higher moments where we just take our, our coordinates and, and look at higher powers of them integrated against the, the density. We get skewedness for the third, right? Think of x cubed. You can think about how un unbalanced your um, uh, distribution is. By using the third moment, something called kurtosis for the fourth moment, which is uh, which is fun. They go on. There are more fun names for these, and and you start realizing that kind of you end up working backwards you know, in uh, uh, in probability when thinking about if you know all the moments, do you know something about your uh, distribution? That's a very interesting analytical question, um, um, and stuff you'll get to in the past. Uh, so there, right? 
integral if they're going to be with you for the rest of your scientific career. Uh, hopefully, the more context you see them, you get a real understanding of what these things are and what are you doing. You've got some region, right, in space. It could be two-dimensional, one-dimensional, three, 18-dimensional space. You've got some value, some function that you want to kind of add up over that space. So densities are a good, good source of those kinds of functions. And then you measure in the domain of the space, area in the case of two dimensions, volume in the case of three, uh, and so on. So you're adding up the value of your function times volume, added up over the whole thing. All right, I will see you with much more detail for uh, examples in class. Um, thank you.